tendency both by Americans and by foreigners to vastly underestimate American power. We also have to remember that Russia is a third world power, or a third world country. Its GDP ranks somewhat below South, South Korea's. Its per capita GDP makes it 86th in the world. Economy is not that of a great power, it's of a nice middle, middle, middle left rich nation. So it's a very poor country, okay? And it survives by selling raw materials like any third world country. Yeah. Not advanced industrial goods or anything like that. Natural gas. So we begin with the fact that this is a country that blew the chance to become industrialized after the fall of the Soviet Union. And basically is very poor, very tense. The Siberians of all people rise up constantly against the central government. Okay, so It's not a peaceful government. And the capital of the country has not at all influenceable by the government. It's owned by oligarchs, massive oligarchs, who prefer to keep it outside the country, which makes it very hard to develop. So the Russians at reputation as a great power grew from what they were during the Cold War. Now, no, they're not. And we're thinking that. In the meantime, hmm. the underestimation of American power is always breathtaking. We're the largest economy in the world. We control two oceans. We have the largest Navy, the most powerful Air Force and Space Force. And in the United States, we love to tear ourselves down. <laughs> <laughs> well, number one, all Americans hate the government. Whichever is the president, somebody's second, he's stupid and a fool, right? Third, uh, we are lost our history. We were great, but we've lost our greatness and no longer powerful. And we go through this. Yeah. yeah it's, it's our life. It's America. We complain. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's like a Jewish mother. She doesn't leave me alone. <laughs> okay. But in the midst of that, Putin lost the point. He saw unrest in America and he assumed it was like what unrest would be in Russia. It meant very different things. It yeah. didn't affect our military, our capital structure, anything else. It was just a party we were throwing. And so he did not understand what power the U.S. could bring to bear. One of it was NATO. We unified NATO. He's facing NATO now. And the other... Uh, the dollar crushed them. Do a dollar is the currency of international trade. You can't get an any, any, you don't get to play. And so his problem is the least of his problems is Ukraine. <laughs> mm. His problem is that he's been hit staggering blow after staggering blow by the United States, who has a massive coalition. Interestingly, just to go on next to the Chinese reached out to the Canadians today with a suggestion that Canada and, and China should cooperate greatly. And it's very important that we understand on Taiwan, all the things they want to hear. They're not going to come to the Americans to say that. They'll come to the Canadians. So they reached out. Well, they made it the worst bet in human history. They bet that they could have an alliance with Russia that would counterbalance the United States. They misread Russia. They didn't know, I think, that Putin was going to go into this war. And now they're sitting there and they've just had a lesson in what American sanctions look like. Yeah. OK, so that tutorial is delivered and they're reaching out through the Canadians. Well, there are two ways to look. at it. First, any war costs. This is an economic war and it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us inflation, things like that. The job of the president at this point is to explain why these sacrifices are necessary. There's no war without sacrifice. Virtually, we, not many Americans are getting killed in this, or Canadians. But that's for, second, China is in the middle of a massive economic crisis. Its great growth spurt, the situation is very much like this. Capitalism always had a extremely low priced, low wage exporter. In the early 20th century, it was the United States. One half of all industrial uh, manufactured goods were manufactured in the United States. It culminates in the Great Depression, 40 years after it starts. Japan does the same thing in 1950. It's the low cost 
producer. Made in Japan was when I was a kid a joke. Um, and they wind up in a financial crisis and an export crisis. Okay. And it takes what's called the lost generation, which I don't understand why it was lost, but all right, they restructure themselves and they're now this. China's boom began exactly 40 years ago and has had a remarkable growth, not greater than the United States or Japan, just the normal growth you get. And it started at a lower point, so it looks better. And it moved from low cost products to high tech products. In a low cost market, it could dominate. Playing with the South Koreans, the Japanese, the Germans and the Americans, I mean, you're in a different league. And they were doing the same model that they did for low cost, cost cuts. The, the major thing was it was cheaper to buy Chinese technology. Okay, they had nothing else. Well, you've got investment going and the rate of return on investment is not coming in at the level you want. So now what you see in the biggest sector of their economy, um, real estate, that yeah, the biggest yeah. company of all is defaulting. And so are a whole bunch of other companies. The net effect of these defaults are so huge, they're going to go through the entire economy. We had it. The Japanese had it. Standard behavior. But i would written that you know, China was heading toward this because it was simultaneously low balling exports and depending on its potentially worst enemy, the United States to be its largest customer. Okay. And also trying to enter the high tech market based on the low price model. That's hard to do in high tech because high tech's expensive and you've got to have that return on capital and not get it. So right now the Chinese are staggering economically. World Bank has reduced expectations on growth. Their growth rate may be five and a half percent compared to the numbers you used to see. It's not. And most important, the West, the coastal part of the country is well to do. The rest of the country is incredibly impoverished. And this is where Mao Zedong took the long march where he raised the peasant army to do it. Their biggest fear is that sort of thing. And now they're imp imposing incredible security on the country. Incredible arrests going on that we don't understand and stuff like that. Sure. So China <clears throat> allied with Russia because it was looking for Russian help. It was not expecting to have to help Russia. Russia allied with them because they're expecting Chinese help. So this was one of those misguided alliances. Well, China looks at the cauldron Russia's swimming in financially, and it suddenly hits it that has been playing with fire. It's backing off, which is why that meeting in Chicago in uh, Canada was so important. The Chinese approach to Canadians who've had their problems with the Chinese, uh, but with a kind of olive branch, we're not looking for trouble. We're not well, implicit. In this is, we're not going to back the Russians, but you, the Canadians and us should have the kind of friendship we used to have. The Canadians immediately understood who they were talking to, and it wasn't Canadians. They were talking to the Americans. Because if you're the Russian, you're, you're China, and you look at what the U.S. has done to Russia, and you remember that this is your biggest customer, really what you want to say is don't shoot, Kamarad. The whole world is changing its dynamic now.